Hi, this is Reverend Dr. Nadine Rosechild Sullivan, and I am reading from my book, I Trusted You Fully and Honestly Speaking of Gendered Assault. I'm going to read three um, stories about men who were victimized by sexual predation of one form or another. Um, in reading this, I want to say that um, that it's, it's very important to recognize that um, anyone can be victimized at any age. And, um, and so it is important to recognize that while statistically there are much higher probabilities of women being victimized and of um, and children being victimized, that that's not exclusive. And, um, and while overwhelmingly most perpetrators are male, that's also not exclusive. And so this isn't about an abuse of power. Um, sexual assault is about victimization. It's about, um, it's about enjoying robbing someone of something, taking something uh, not offered and violating innocence at some level. And so there's a trigger warning on the readings in the sense that um, this is an uncomfortable topic. It's in a, you know, the subject of the book is that. And, um, and you know, there's, you know, some emotional power in these stories. It's also important to note that, um, that, um, that none of these stories should be taken to bear any resemblance to people living or deceased of you know anybody individual that anybody might think they know or whatever um, these are um, they are the combinations of multiple 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 stories and to collectivities so I'm going to begin with page 146 a story called watched a male retelling meaning it's the um, the voice the person speaking is a boy, is a man, a male. My dad left his magazines around. I was good with that. Well, not really around, more like hidden in the back of his closet. But they did just stand there under his dress slacks and sport coats, like a little leaning mini tower of Pisa. It was great to sneak in there and scan them either by myself or with Jeff, the neighbor next door. Whenever both of my parents went to work and my sister locked herself in her room to talk on the phone in private, Jeff would come over and we would go through the stack in the closet and then through my parents' night tables and dresser drawers. Like detectives on a case, we would look for grown-up things. We found one of those pink, flesh-colored, hard plastic, ribbed-bottomed back massagers you could buy in the drugstore, the kind that took two C batteries and had a picture of a flowing-haired woman on the box pointing holding the pointed top to her left shoulder muscle, but we had no idea what you did with it, in part because the picture misled us. In the same drawer, I saw my first condom. Again, for a little while, we drew a blank, though the shape kind of gave us an idea. But we knew what we wanted to do with those pictures. When a stack got tall enough, we would each slip one magazine out. I hid mine under my mattress, but my mom found it when she made the bed and yelled at my father for so long, he left for the bar and didn't come home till after dinner. We discovered masturbation. We didn't really say much about it, but if one of us slept over the other's house, we would pull out the hidden magazine, look a while, and then both pretend to go asleep, go to sleep. In a few minutes, I could hear Jeff making breathing noises on the mat on the floor where he slept, and his sleeping bag started moving. I looked up to my dad. We weren't what you'd call close. He worked a lot, and when he was around, he just sort of huffed and puffed and ate. He had trouble breathing, and he never said much more than, hey man, how you doing? But having him there was important. I was not like the other kids who'd lost their dad. And I figured anything he did was something I should do, too. I thought it was heroic, how hard he worked, even when he didn't feel good. And I wanted to know all he knew about those pictures and the adult stuff in the night tables and women. He swung shifts, days. He swung shifts and days. Sometimes, if his day off from work fell on a weekend, he would take me out with him, just us two guys. Twice, he even took me to the shore by himself. He got in trouble with my mom for my sunburn that day. But always we'd end up at a bar part way across town where someone seemed to know him and he bought a round of beers for a couple of buddies and a woman or two. Afterward, he'd tell me, don't tell mommy about the broads and it would be our little secret. As I got to be about 12 or 13, a couple of times when mom was working and my sister was out with her friends, he would suggest that I see if Jeff were around and invite him over. 
If Jeff could come over, he'd watch us play ball, then suggest we take a shower to cool off. One time, when we, when we went to take the shower quietly, Dad just let himself into the bathroom. We never locked doors in our house, so I didn't think much about it. He said he had to take a dump, and our house only had one bathroom. But the shower door was glass, and except, except for the steam, it was clear. I glanced over at him sitting there. Like the water from the shower head, I was swept with the oddest sensation deep in my stomach. He was fondling his own erection. I distracted Jeff and pretended not to notice until Dad moaned a couple of times and left. I stopped going out with him on weekends after that. After that, I just got too busy with other stuff. And a tale called Internet Predator, also a male retelling that begins on page 58. Jack started messaging me on Facebook. I was excited. He looked so hot. I knew I was gay since I was like six, maybe five. But you could never say that out loud in my house. My moms would have worn me out. She was really my aunt. My bio mom had left out about eight years back with her latest man leaving a string of us farmed out to different family. My mom who had trained me, who had raised me was a sister in white at her cousin's church. And there about as often as she blessed communion, Pastor Maddie railed against the fairies and the sin that had turned God's hand against us. A number of the brothers in their congregation and their wives had the virus. And that was always her object lesson to the little ones. It was the plague unleashed on us from our own wrongdoing, God's loving chastisement to save the sinner before the judgment, a conviction of the Holy Ghost, a chance to turn before we burned. There was no way I could do what some of the celebrities were starting to do. I could not have come out. There was no way I could date or even suggest to one of my friends that we try something. Jack, Jack asked, so I held my phone up in the bathroom mirror and sent him a shot of my chest. Then he sexted me a pic of his jewels. I got hot just thinking about them. His looked like all those dicks I downloaded late at night when mom was safely snoring in her room. It was rough not having a room to myself, always having to stroke it under the covers quietly, hoping she didn't wake up and catch me on her way to pee. I got a lot of good action out of his sext, more than once a day in the shower. Mom's was always on me for staying long in the bathroom or showering so much, but a man's got to do. When she let me go out, which wasn't that often, I'd play ball just to be near some male flesh. I couldn't let on, but Drew really turned me on. He was six foot two next to my sprouting five foot 11, and his sweat glistened on the, in the sun as he bit his upper lip, all serious while making a shot. But I could never have moved on him. I'd have got my ass whooped and I wouldn't have won against him neither. And the boys would have known, couldn't do it. Jack kept sending me pics. He didn't look too bad for someone that old. I guess 40 wasn't so bad. And he said he had some money, a real job, a house, a nice car. Wanted my address to send me a gift, but I didn't dare. Talked about taking me places far away. We made a date. I told my moms I was going to Drew's, and just after dark, I started toward the place we set to meet. I slipped around the corner and a couple blocks, of blocks away to a side street where the lamps were burnt out. The car was a lot older and more run down than I expected, but it was the right color and make. Then he tapped the horn and waved me inside. I slipped in the back like we'd agreed. His baseball cap was slung low over his face, but I recognized his voice from our calls. My heart was pounding. This was my first date with a guy. Oh my God, he wasn't a John. The familiar sound of his voice helped me relax. Suddenly he pulled off the road and into the state park. I thought he was taking me for something to eat, but he had waited so long he couldn't wait anymore. He hopped out and slid into the back seat next to me, tearing at my clothes and pressing his mouth against mine. It was all going kind of fast. I realized he slobbered. So I pushed him back, knocking his cap. That's when I saw it wasn't him. This wasn't the guy in the pictures. This guy could have been my grandfather or great-grandfather. And it wasn't just that he looked way older than the pics. The pics weren't him at all, ever, at any age. Not so I could tell anyway. 
He pulled his zipper down and his dip popped free. It wasn't the same dick either. It was small and pale and turned. He began shoving at the back of my head, trying to push my head down to suck it. He shoved me close, but it smelled like pee, old pee that had been around a while. I started to shove back, to shove him off, trying to think. Where was I? I wasn't far from home. What turns had he made? I went for the door. Man, I'm out of here, when he grabbed me. I caught the flash of the blade in the moonlight before I felt it sharp against my neck. Low and mean, his voice said, you're going to do what I say now. Drop your drawers. I thought of grabbing it, but wasn't sure how to get a good hold on the handle or him without getting sliced bad. I felt the point of the blade drawing blood. He was old, but not weak. I followed instructions. He had me get out of the car. He bound my hands and feet with silver tape. All the while, I was steady talking, telling him there was no need to do this. No, no need to do it this way. He tripped me forward, kicked me hard, twice for good measure, then rammed me in the grass. When he finished, he said, you'll never forget me. Adding, if I ever get any trouble from this, if this ever gets back to my wife or kids, I know where to find you. He drew the blade down my ass for good measure, he said. The warm red oozed down my thigh, or was it his stuff? He left me in the grass, pointed away from his plates and sped away. I struggled, but he had bound me too tight. Next morning, two grade school girls in uniform found me on their way to school, pants down, blood crusted. I felt for them, their first sight of a man's dick and ass were mine, hanging out covered with morning frost. At the hospital, they took his DNA from my ass, but it didn't make a match. His internet profile had disappeared. It was bogus anyway. I'm not sure how mom spelled it first. I don't know if she was more upset I'd been gone all night and worried her or mad I'd been stupid enough to hook up online or more horrified that I was gay. Now she tells me she knew all along since I was like two years old and she had found my internet porn months before. Now that I have the virus, everyone at Pastor Maddie's church knows too. They put in a prayer request for me, you know, the prayer request gossip grapevine. They all still love me though. They tell me too often that they're sinners too. And they tell me how I have to resist sin and not act out on it. They say, God doesn't give us permission to just go on and do any old thing we want. He has rules and the classic, he doesn't give us more temptation than we can bear. I just wonder why God would give us temptation at all. Yeah, they love me, but they watch me real close, especially around the little boys. I'm not allowed to sit in youth group anymore. I have to sit in the sanctuary with the grown sisters and brothers. And every so often, everyone goes to cluck in their teeth when pastor gets to preaching on gay folk, gender lines are being crossed. Do you hear me? God is not happy with this nation. Gender lines are being crossed. And one more. This begins on page 165 and it's called, also a male retelling, it's called Climbing on Top. As a kid, my older brother was my idol. My attachment wasn't hurt any by the beers he gave me when mom wasn't home. I would take two, down them like someone was gonna hijack them then head back to my room to play. I was a gamer. I played every possible waking moment. I kicked ass at Halo. One night when I had gotten to be about 13, I was back in my room feeling the beers from his stash, trying to kick ass and laughing at myself when the door opened. I glanced over and went back to playing. It was my brother's friend, Kristen. She was 22 and kind of drunk herself. I tossed over my shoulder that she was in the wrong room and kept playing. Suddenly, Kristen was pushing me back and climbing on top of me. Even with the beer on my breath, the beer and cigarettes on her breath weren't all that good. I said, hey, and started to push her off till she pulled up her skirt. She had no panties on and started rubbing herself all over my crotch. I was like, Kristen, I don't want to do this. I don't like you like that. I actually had always thought that the first time should be something special with someone special. 
And there was someone I wanted it to be someday, someone I was talking to and working up the courage to kiss. But Kristen started taunting me. What kind of man was I? Maybe I was still just a little boy. What kind of man wouldn't take it when he could get it? And she kept stroking me, working on my zipper and teasing. Between taunts, her beer mouth was all over me, and before I was sure how, her breasts were out and in my face. My mind was turned off, but my body was responding, and I got confused. I didn't know what to do. I wanted her to stop, but suddenly I wanted her to keep going, and as she pulled my pants down and sat on my dick, it was over almost before I knew it. I've had this vague sense of being robbed ever since. That was my first time. My first time didn't go down the way I wanted it to. I never told the girl I liked. I just kind of dropped her. And later when I got another girlfriend and she wanted to do it, I pretended to myself that it was my first time. I never really thought about it as rape, but I think if I were a girl and she were a man, a man nine years older, the fact that I said no would make everyone think it was. Let me just end with the thought that um, a lot of people would treat that last story like he got lucky. But if you switch the genders and the ages, not only would it be coercive, it would be statutory. And body betrayal is real. And body betrayal does not indicate complicity. If you have been victimized and your body responded, you were not complicit. Even Oprah has talked about, as a child, how her body responded. Those are sex-specific nerve endings. And if someone is not unduly rough, then um, them being fondled or touched is, or stimulated is pleasant and um, physically, but the mind and the emotions can still be in shock and horror, and it can still have all of the emotional aftermath, uh, depression and nausea and, and, you know, just that feeling that that something that is there that takes months and months and months to process and hopefully um, recover from. But there's, you know, all that, all that that would have been to a teenage girl that also can be and would be to a teenage boy. So um, recognizing that there are male victims as well and there are perpetrators of um, all genders. And so thank you for listening. Um, in the description, there are, um, there's information on how to book a spiritual counseling appointment with me and um, information on my books and on my forthcoming work on contraception as a, on birth control as a precondition of the liberation of women and uh, my book on the marriage equality movement and my book on uh, scriptures used against gay people and my book on manifesting um, your desired life and so i thank you for listening and um and uh, until next time